Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. Five years into the SDGs, are we track on uh, are we on track to deliver the land targets? So uh, this webinar is organized by the SDG Land Momentum Group as a virtual side event on the ongoing, rather concluding 2020 SDG High Level Political Forum. So if any one of you wonder uh, what is SDG Land Momentum Group, it's a coalition of civil society organizations who have come together and also some multilateral agencies who have come together to advocate for the implementation of the land targets of the SDGs and also to monitor the uh, uh, or the measure the progress of them. So my name is uh, uh, Rukshana and I work as the global policy and advocacy expert um, at the International Land Coalition. So I again want to thank all of you for joining this webinar from different parts of the world and um, um, making yourself available. So as we start the webinar, I just want to at the very beginning highlight the objectives and um, what we would be taking at the end of this webinar. So as you all know, in the present COVID-19 and hopefully sooner than later in the post COVID-19 period. So we just want to highlight what are the particular challenges in achieving secure land tenure for uh, women and uh, men. In that context, in the context of those challenges, we want to look at the 2020, 2030 um, SDG development agenda. And is it adequate to face those challenges or do we have to look at um, new ways and means and engagement strategies um, in the present context that we exist. So also, we, this is the last decade of SDG um, implementation. And how do we really engage governments and the civil society to report um, looking at the SDG land targets? So at the end of the day, we believe as we end the, uh, as we end the webinar that you will be able to walk away with few messages. So what are the strategies which are available to face the present challenges? And what are the um, you know, technicalities which are needed to face the challenges? And also, how do we engage with governments and other stakeholders on SDG reporting? So let's start the webinar and I will be introducing the speakers as they are about to speak. Um, and the format of the webinar is that um, from each of the panelists, I'll be asking two questions. And after the two questions, um, uh, you will get an opportunity as the audience uh, to ask questions. As you may have already noted that your mics are muted, but you can type your questions into the chat room. And if you look at the screen, at the bottom of it, there is an icon called Q&A. You can open it and type your comment or question. When you type a question, if you direct that question to a particular speaker, you can identify the speaker. So that makes things easier. Just for your records, this webinar is on record. So all of you know that you are on record. And as we are about to start the webinar, I just want to say that we're going to do like a little bit of a temperature check. So we have an encouraging number of participants. We just want to see where you're joining from and what actually, which sector that you are representing. So my colleague from Land Portal, Romy, is going to support us. And she's going to post two questions on the screen. And they are very straightforward. And we take a few seconds to answer them. And we can see um, where you're coming from and which sector that you are representing. Here we go. The questions are on your screen now. All right, I think everybody got an opportunity and then we can see the results. So the first question is in which region are you based? So um, there are 41% is from Europe and Central Asia. And then we also have another 41% very encouraging number from Sub-Saharan Africa. And then the third 4% from uh, Middle East and North Africa. And we have 29% uh, joining from Asia and the Pacific. Another 27 from North America. 10% from South America and 4% from uh, Central America. So also we ask which sector that you represent today 
and we have huge number of um, participation from civil society and NGOs, which is 75, and we can see 16% from donor agencies, and universities, knowledge institutes, 32%, governments, 8%, and also we have private sector, um, 8%, and from 7% uh, from multilateral organizations. All right, so we can see very diverse group of people taking part in this webinar and also people from different parts of the world. Thank you very much, Romy, um, um, helping us with this. All right, so I'm gonna move to the, uh, the panelist and I'm gonna um, ask the questions from um, each of the panelists in the first round. And uh, we are very lucky to have this panel and I'm gonna um, move to first Patricia, to you and Patricia, Patricia Chavez, and she's the uh, director of Espaso Feminista, which is a network of organizations based in Brazil, and they also work regionally and globally as well. Patricia, tell us a little bit about the challenges that COVID-19 has posed in achieving sexual land rights for women and men. Okay, so good morning from Brazil. And good afternoon um, to everybody. It's a pleasure to be. I feel like home with you. Well, the first thing is to say that the situation, the women's land rights situation in Brazil was already bad, very bad. Just to give you a country of inequality, informality, and now we discover that we have 20% of our population is invisible to governments and to policies. So the situation was very bad, very bad. And then the COVID, the pandemic, increased and deepened the problems of informality and related to SDGs, to the, our target and thinking about women's land rights, yes, it's very bad. Just to give you one idea, uh, in, a, in a ministerial uh, meeting, uh, the Minister of uh, Environment said, let's take advantage of the media, they all pay attention to the COVID, to the pandemic, let pass the cattle, meaning let land grab, let deregulate all the, uh, the law and, and uh, you know, regulations. So it is posing a huge threat to women's land rights and to indigenous land rights, to the black population. We have a huge problem of racism in our country. So that's the, the first thing. Also, there is a, a concrete problem of hunger. People, and we are working on two different levels. The first levels, when we think about protecting lives and dignity, we are talking about hunger. We are talking about the informality and the, the in, inadequacy of living. We know that we have a huge 22% of our population living in slums without access to uh, water, to drink water, sanitation. So there is a real, real threat to these populations. And uh, yes, it is um, the insecurity of uh, land. It affects uh, essentially widows and we have the widows of COVID. We affect the people in informal areas because it is informal. And so the land grabbers can go. And it's not just talking about big companies, multinational companies. We are talking about next door neighbors, you know, and we see a lot of land grabbing that comes from um, a farmer who is next door. As I wrote, um, I wrote a, a, a blog saying that, uh, you know, in times of when the, someone dies in a community, during the funeral, people come to the widow to try to get her land. So that things are increasing in, enormously. And um, also, I think that, um, yeah, so the situation right now, if you look at the indigenous population, what is happening? in the Amazonia, but not just in the Amazonia, what is happening everywhere to the Quilombolas community. You know, we were in a process of recognizing the rights of these uh, 
communities and also in the informal settlements people are dying because of the police um, the police violence so yes it's a major concern a major concern for us um, to uh, to protect we did a campaign i don't have time to explain thinking about this we did a campaign and we from the march 15 to yesterday yesterday people were receiving uh food supply so we work in two different levels protecting the lives and protecting the lives in two different ways protecting the lives because of the covid supporting these women feeding we establish a huge network to uh, supply food supply the basic things alcohol and we get a lot of donations from the private sector so in the pandemic we also get some surprise we had the huge in our campaign we had a huge collaboration from the private sector but also protecting rights and trying to establish uh, supporting the people to access the you know these um, policies and the uh, emergency uh, support from the government it's just an allowance of uh, 120 dollars so we had to support people because everything is on in the internet you have to register on the internet but also supporting the rights informing the people how can you support how can you ensure your rights during this pandemic so we got a um, like a, a network of um, you know of supporters is including lawyers and uh, also governments and we work with the government so yes i think that um, the covid is um, yeah it's it's um, it's a, it's a, a huge threat for us yeah. and it's global yeah, thank you, Patricia, for highlighting some of the uh, challenges. And we can see that increased amounts of um, violence um, and also together with that, uh, the opportunity and the space to mobilize, mobilize resources are also shrinking. And there are challenges in relation to that we have highlighted technology. Um, and also this is um, new COVID um, has created um, single women and what about their property rights and, and their access to land. Right, so we're going to elaborate that on a little bit uh, more later on. I'm going to move on to Diana. Diana is uh, Diana Fleshner. Is, she's the Senior Director of Research, Evaluation and Learning at Landesa. Um, Diana, already there are different stakeholders who are reporting at, um, uh, on SDG targets. We know that 47 countries um, have reported in this year's um, uh, uh, high-level political forum. So stakeholders are engaging and they are reporting on the 2030 framework. Um, are they reporting on land rights? And what kind of progress are they talking about? Have you really made any progress? Diana? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, um, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, uh, this is a very timely conversation. As, as Patricia said before, um, COVID is, of course, exacerbating all the problems that people are facing, but the reality is uh, many, many, many people around the world were already uh, facing land rights challenges. And we all recognize that and understood that the SDGs were um, a good instrument to try to uh, bring attention to these issues and compel governments to act and either grant or protect those rights. And so, um, Today, it's a good opportunity to see how are we doing here. We thought um, in the past few years uh, that we had a huge victory when we got land rights to be included in the, in the SDGs, um, included under goals to, ready, to eradicate poverty, to re, uh, eliminate food insecurity, and to achieve gender equality. Um, and it was a... a fantastic win. This is a very important tool that we can use. And yet, uh, we cannot take things for granted. The fact that these things are written in paper and that there are formal commitments doesn't necessarily mean that they will translate into changing reality. And so the big question today is, what are we doing? How are we doing? Uh, five of the 15 years have passed. Um, 
And yes, having land rights in the agenda is, is uh, a fantastic step, but countries have committed to many, many things under the SDGs. Um, and countries have limited capacity, and countries already had some degree of infrastructure to deal with the other commitments. Uh, addressing land rights issue, and particularly land rights of the people who are in a um, poor or vulnerable situation, in, in, and for women, um, requires resources and times and, and special attention. And so we know going in that this is a, this is a challenge. And to assess where we are, um, as Roxana, you were saying, um, a good tool is to look at the voluntary national reviews. Uh, 47 of the almost 200 countries involved in this process um, agreed to review how they were doing um, on a handful of goals for the high level political forum. Those goals include all the land rights commitments. So this is a um, key moment for those of us championing land rights. And um, this, the, the SDGs have the two sides. On the one hand, they allow us to celebrate uh, progress, to, to look at who's being an effective champion of land rights uh, and who we have to recognize. And in, in those cases, I think there's a few examples I can point out. Um, uh, the voluntary national reviews of Ecuador and Honduras, for example, um, talk about efforts to formalize land rights. Uh, uh, in Ecuador, uh, given land titles to over 70,000 um, um, smallholders, small and medium agricultural holders. Uh, in Honduras, uh, also a titling program. Uh, we can highlight uh, work done by the government in Bangladesh uh, that um, paid attention to women's land rights and reports uh, working um, under a project called My House, My Farm uh, to cover 40 southern villages in Bangladesh and um, uh, guaranteeing or, or recognizing the rights of um, close to 700 southern women. Um, we can recognize work done by the government of Tanzania, where um, they've, they're going a, a different route. So we're not talking about documentation programs, but rather bringing stakeholders together, different government agencies and members of civil society under a multi-stakeholder platform um, that's uh, coordinated by the Secretary of Gender. Uh, to see how to advance women's land rights um, in a um, uh, coordinated and cohesive way. Um, and we also notice um, a good example from Liberia where the government has passed a, or passed the Land Rights Act in uh, 2018. This is an act that's very promising because uh, it allows uh, it, it uh, improves the access to uh, land for rural people and um, better coordinates customary rights with statutory rights and so forth. Um, so you see there is a handful of examples. Um, there's also a few governments who have reported on the land rights indicators. Um, but nice as this is, I have to um, say that these efforts are all promising efforts, for the most part, when they deliver, they're still in their initial stages, they're setting things in the right direction, uh, or they have addressed the needs of a number of people, but still have to cover an additional significant gap. So we celebrate the steps that I have taken, we recognize that there's still um, a fair amount of work to do for those countries. Now, you notice that I only mention a few examples. Uh, and the reality is that um, if we want to uh, get to the type of world that we all aspire to, to see in the near future, um, we do need to move a lot farther, a lot faster, and a lot more deliberately. Um, uh, the vast majority of the countries who have reported, um, and I, I want to say that these are countries who chose to report this year, and chose to report in a year where three of the goals mention explicitly land rights, uh, the vast majority of the countries did not report one word about land rights. Uh, 
in um, the few who said something, uh, in addition to the examples I mentioned earlier, have said very little and uh, kept it um, fairly vague. And so um, I guess uh, I want to recognize the, those who have taken action and those who have uh, believed enough in these things to mention them and to highlight them when they report to the high le level political forum. But for those of us who are here who want to make sure there is a difference on the ground and that people can enjoy secure rights, this is a very important call to say we need to do more. And we need to, um, and, and I like that in this uh, group there is people from different sectors, we need to see what role can we play, each of us, to move in a direction that helps um, governments and everybody else really uh, take the steps needed to guarantee these rights. Yeah, thank you, Dana. I think it's also a very good segue to start the uh, move on to the uh, next speaker. But before that, I just want to say we were trying to get a speaker from a, a government. Unfortunately, at the last minute, she couldn't join. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, there are member states actually, or member state representatives who are taking part in this webinar. And so please feel free to comment or even uh, ask questions. Um, uh, we want to hear from you as well. So uh, you said that there are very few governments who have actually um, reported on SDG land targets. So then the, who is going to report on that? Can the civil society report? So with that, I'm going to move on to the next panelist, who's uh, Liv Nelson. And she works for the International Land Coalition's Latin America team. And she works on the initiative on SDGs and, um, and, and land. Uh, Liv, just want to ask how CSOs have grappled with these challenges that Patricia has mentioned, and then also Diana has mentioned in relation to like reporting, and and how they have tried to report. So, what's your experience in relation to that? Well, uh, as you well said, Patricia and Diana made a perfect introduction to the issue. Um, Land threats, to land, uh, threats to land rights uh, already existed before the pandemic situation, right? And now with the whole COVID situation, social distances, national, regional, and personal circumstances got into the way uh, some at times while doing the alternative reports. Fortunately, uh, each organization managed to be creative and resourceful at the same time in order to uh, tackle this particular situation, right? Um, as well as, uh, I must say, the teamwork and the strong commitment that organizations uh, showed with um, land governance and gender equitable land tenure rights was uh, strong enough to <laughs> uh, face the, the context. As well as, um, well, all the monitoring, training and support that we received from ILC and Landesa, which was of great value in the process. And uh, well, not to mention the financial support that allowed not only to hire research and consultants, but also experts in land matter. So that was of great value as well. That helped a lot uh, while performing these uh, reports. On the other hand, um, well, as um, Diana said, there is uh, almost no information uh, land related whatsoever. So when there is some information available, it's, uh, as she said, extremely vague, uh, or sometimes it's even difficult to um, uh, comprehend or analyze for community in general. So that was a struggle. And, uh, and well, as she also said, most governments uh, decide not to include um, land-related SDG targets or indicators in their national voluntary reviews. So, so it was even harder for us to uh, manage to compare and contrast right, both reviews or to get some previous information. And in this context of social distances and uh, pandemic crisis, right, public offices uh, were closed. So it was even harder to uh, get uh, direct information from the government. I mean, if it wasn't online, then you had no chance to uh, get it whatsoever. You couldn't go and knock the door, right, <laughs> to the public office. So, yeah, it was quite a struggle, um, but uh, we managed. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, thank you, Liv. That's, uh, that's very clear. But um, 
I just want to move on to the next round of questions, but before that, we can see some questions are coming in. So um, if you have any questions or comment, please go to the icon called Q&A. You can type your question there. So um, I'm going to move on to the last round of questions before opening the floor for um, the discussion. Um, as you said, now it's somewhat challenging in relation to reporting on land targets. Um, and COVID-19 has posed extra challenges as well in this context. So we really want to look forward to 2021. So in 2020, things were hard, things were difficult. So, but 2021, how that's going to be like? And mind you, we have only 10 years to achieve the 2030 agenda. So I'm going to look at 2021 and beyond and ask from um, each of you, you know, um, in your role right now, representing the role that you are currently at. So what do you suggest for 2021 for countries to meet the land targets by 2030? So Patricia, what do you suggest? How should countries report and what yes. they should be doing to report on land targets? Yes. Uh, the first thing that uh, I have to say, and uh, I think that most people that knows me know that I have been saying this since 2013, is that we cannot rely on governments to implement the goals. There is a difference between reporting and implementing. If, and many people heard from me about this, if we are to meet the targets and goals, we have to do these things differently. We have to look at the change, and the change come from good policies, good governance. So my first thing is, we have to look at civil society, we have to look from bottom up. I think that the first thing we, Spartu Feministas, have been working from bottom up since 2015, working with local governments and state governments, but especially on local governments, because we, first thing, we have to shift power between the global governments and civil society and women in special. We, and to do this, we have first to use the goals and targets and indicators to inform this population, creating what we call political will. We, political will doesn't exist. As the, the minister of Brazil said, there is, we have to acknowledge that there is, a, how can I say, conflict of interest. Land grabbers have no will to, um, to do women's land rights, you know, families. We live in a very patriarchal society, machist society, so it's nothing is going to be granted for us. And it's not just reporting. It's really making a huge effort to implement good policies that can shift this, um, you know, the situation. We in Espanso Feminista, we have been collecting evidence, and it's very important. It's very important to sit and we are not against governments, we are in favor of governments, but we have to sit on the government and say, look, look, we have evidence, we have collected data and analyzed data and used data to shift, to make concrete shift in a mood stakeholder platform, like in Bonito, in one municipality, we collect data, we analyze data, we discover that 75% of the people living in these urban and rural areas were very insecure. The land belonged to the municipality. And what we did, we called the government and we are in a process of regularizing on the name of women in first. So it's this kind of thing that we have to engage, but we are not doing just locally. We are doing locally, connect with the national and global. And so I think that the first thing that we have is uh, we have to work in coalitions. We have to work uh, not just as, a, you know, as a, a civil society. We have to understand the role of private sector. We just did the work in the Zona da Mata North in one area. We, we compare the agricultural census between 2006 and 2017 against a huge public and, and public and private investment. We are talking about a huge Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler, um, how can I say, Fiat Chrysler plant. And we discovered that during this process, there is a big shift 
and it was really women's land rights and all the data that we, we have, all the indicators were showing that this project had a very bad effect. What we did? Okay, using this data, informing women, and it's very important to shift power, getting, we are not working just locally, as I said, nationally, with all these movements and networks, we sat with the government and said, look, look, public money is increasing. The size of women's property is, you know, undermining the, the women's situation and establishing a good conversation, say, you have to do better, and not just with government, and also with the yeah. private sector. So yeah. I think that we have, to, we have to do this systematically, and also, just, just to finish, it's very important that once we have these numbers, this evidence, we have to go a step forward. In Bonito, we have to build a very good evidence and analysis about what, what happened when women have tenure security. And we are talking about 75% of the, you know, the, the, the municipality. What happened at, at family level, shifting power, ensuring women's you know, right. What happens to the community? How this community will be in, let's say, three years? Is that going to be a, a, big, change, a big change in terms of infrastructure, you know, in terms of environment? So that's what we have to do. And we have to do learning from each other in a South-South cooperation. I think I spoke okay. too much. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, um, Patricia. So bringing that building partnerships and also, you know, multiple of um, uh, production of uh, data by different uh, groups, particularly from civil society as well. Um, and also um, highlighting positive stories in this context. If these rights are being achieved, what it would bring to the society, to a country for the benefit of it. I think I'm going to move to Diana. Diana, um, so what we should be doing to encourage reporting. I'm mean, also gonna ask like one question because you work on data as well. Sometimes when civil society produce data and governments don't accept them. So they frown at data which is produced by other sources. So how also when you encourage civil society to report in the next decade, how do you make it like legitimate that we produce legitimate data which is equally valid as a measurement target? Great, um, thank you, Roxana. And building on Patricia's comments, because she, she gave a lot of detail on, on quite specific examples, uh, there are, there are um, ideas that we should just take from there uh, because they apply to all of us. And I'm thinking about the fact that we had to get to something concrete. Let's, not, let's stop talking about generalities and vague statements. Let's get to what are the specific changes that can be done. We have to recognize that we all have a role to play. Obviously, government at different levels uh, have uh, very clear responsibilities that they have to enact, but we as civil society can support that process and can support it in a constructive way, contributing to the dialogue, contributing with evidence, and can support it from the perspective of holding people accountable as well. Um, and so regardless of where you sit, and whether you work at the local level, at the national level, at the global or regional level, we all can play a, a role here. Um, I see the, the, one of the beauties of the SDGs as a mechanism to allow us to have a cohesive conversation and to try to all move in a similar direction, to therefore amplify what we're doing so that, so that the changes significant um, and not just a collection of um, isolated um, interventions. And so um, on the comment on reporting, I, I want to make sure that we understand why we're talking about reporting here. Um, obviously, the, the really important piece is for people to act on their commitments. Uh, that's, what, that's what we want to see. We want to see change on the ground. Um, the, what the SDGs give us is a mechanism to advance those actions. And the way we can advance those actions is by leveraging the reporting. Otherwise, 
the SDGs are just a series of meetings that will happen behind doors or through Zoom now, um, but would not really translate into change in practice. And so um, uh, I'm going to speak from the perspective of Landesa and the work that we're doing with the um, SDG Land Momentum Group. And what we thought was we need to um, help stakeholders report. The more positive noise that we make around this, the more important it will become in everybody's agenda, the more compelled governments will have to, uh, will feel to act. And so um, what we thought was, well, this can be a really challenging process for people who have not been involved in these, uh, in, in agendas like the SDGs, uh, who are not used to uh, moving in these circles. Um, and so our first um, task was, how can we make this something easier, less intimidating, in an area where people see the importance of report. Um, and then the second piece is, how do we make sure that when people report, they actually contribute information that's useful, information that helps them think about what they want to prioritize, information that signals to their governments or to their constituencies what they're doing and what they should be doing and what they plan to do in the future, and information that signals to uh, those who are funding this work in which direction we're all moving. Um, and for examples like the one Patricia mentioned, how can people working in related or similar issues somewhere else in the world see that they have uh, challenges in common or that they can do work together? And so it was important not only to convince people to report, but also to convince people to do it in a way that was meaningful and that was easy to um, read and to compare and contrast. And then the third piece was the information has to be easily available to people. We cannot have to go through multiple layers of websites and the SDGs and manuals and voluntary reports looking for one paragraph lost somewhere in there. We need to have something that is easily accessible. So what we're doing is we created templates, relatively simple templates, for governments and for civil societies. And we're working on doing something similar for groups on the ground so that they can use the very specific commitments that, there, that were made under the SDGs, essentially a commitment to ensure that everybody would have secure land rights, a commitment to ensure that small agricultural producers would have access to land, and a commitment to ensure that there would be gender equality when it came to land rights. Um, mm -hmm. So for each of these commitments, we're asking uh, government, civil society, and groups on the ground to look at, okay, what is the relevant authority, the relevant government structure planning to do? What are they saying in their country, in their locality that they will do? What changes have they introduced when it, came, it comes to legal reforms or policy reforms or, or institutional governance? What programmatic actions are they introducing? And then what's going on? What, does, what is the data telling us? How, how bad or how good things are things for whom? How is that changing over time? And this ties back to your comment or to your question, Roxana, on data. I think we need to get less hang up on whether this is the official data and whether it's a there is the data that's reported um, through the, all the um, official channels, which of course has value and which of course we're trying to build towards. We all need data. We are desperately craving for that. And different people are working at different levels to make sure that that infrastructure exists. But that infrastructure will take time. It will be years before most countries have reliable primary data that's meaningful um, and that meets all the criteria that we want to see. So in the meantime, people's lives continue to happen and people's challenges continue. What can we do to address that? It is of course possible that groups of women can gather some data and use that data to advocate for their changes. Uh, it's of course possible for the private sector and for other initiatives to uh, support these efforts with data and it is obviously a responsibility of the national uh, statistical agencies to think of what uh, infrastructure they're building for their future. These are all things that combine together to 
eventually translate uh, into change on the ground. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Diana. I know that we got about 27 questions and we have limited amount of time. But Liv, um, there was a question for you and which asked actually why governments are not reporting? Why are they reluctant to report on land targets? And you are coming from the civil society. And you know, when governments are to report in the next decade, you know, what do you have to say? Why are they not reporting? And what, what do we have to do from the civil society part to encourage them to report? Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's quite a challenge. I think that um, since uh, land-related information, it's so difficult to come across with, as Diana just explained, we believe that it's necessary to strengthen the dialogue between the civil society and the government. In order to get direct information, or not, but to get a dialogue with the government, and at the same time to create opportunities for the uh, civil society to present their reports to the government and then work, work together, right? Um, at the same time, we believe that, um, well, the technical and financial support that uh, it will be extremely necessary for next year as well as the training and uh, financial support in order to hire consultants, uh, experts, and uh, researchers in the matter. And um, also, we believe it's, um, it's important to generate a common communicational strategy yeah. uh, in order to help and assist civil societies to communicate Sorry. Yeah, it looks like we're having me? some technical issues in, in hearing you. Um, yeah, if you can repeat in 30 seconds what you said, and then we move on to the next question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I... Last point then. I think that it's important, we believe it's important to generate a strong communicational strategy to help and assist civil societies organization to uh, communicate their reports, not only to the government, but also to community in general. Community needs to know also about the alternative report. Did you hear me? Did you manage to hear me? Yeah, Please say yes. I think the message from you is, yeah, there were some still uh, technical glitches, but uh, okay. the message is that we have to have the civil society part, uh, clear communication strategies once we have the report to communicate the results. And, um, and reach out to like a wider community. All right, so we have a number of questions. As you said, Patricia, there's an interesting question for you. And it asks, do you in Brazil have any legal provisions to protect land rights for single women? So it further says, in spite of legal provisions, we don't see much difference in land holding by women in India. Thanks for that question, Patricia. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, it's a very good question, and it, yes, yes. And for instance, in, in this area in Bonito, we, and we create lay the laws is are to be interpreted, and we can interpret and use in our favor. So, yes, we are doing, for instance, in Bonito, we are doing this regularization process, people living there for 30 years without any, you know, security of tenure. We are using these regardless of their marital status. Because as I said, and also to LGBT, doesn't matter, you know, the kind of arrangement we, you are, we are protecting the rights of women, single women. The titles are going to be first on the name of women, and then if they are married, if they are not married, they are living with someone, then the second layer is um, for the men. So yes, we have, and we okay. have to use and interpret in our favor. Okay, Diana, there's a specific question for you. It says, how the tenure security within the customary systems or over common or communal land or forestry or water are measured when countries report on land-related SDG indicators? So how do you basically report on customary systems or common yeah. lands? Yeah. Yes, um, very quickly, I want to say that on the data side, on the indicators, uh, we very deliberately chose indicators that look at the final outcome. So we are asking people or we're asking governments to report whether people say that they feel tenure secure and whether people feel that they have or think that they have a document that can prove they have rights to land. 
Uh, and so we chose these, these indicators, understanding that there are many different regimes in the world. Uh, this means that if somebody is living under a customary um, regime or in, in, under communally managed lands, uh, they can still tell us, do they feel secure? Um, we are not, at this level, we're not distinguishing whether the insecurities come because of the government, because of private uh, sector concessions, because of families or in-laws. Uh, we want to make sure that people feel they are secure in the, uh, on the land that they're using and accessing. That's number one. Um, and the other one is, do they have documents to prove whatever rights they have? Uh, and the idea here is, uh, will the government protect those rights? Um, unless there is some documentation, the government doesn't have the same type of uh, responsibility. And that documentation could be, uh, as is often understood in certain areas, a, a legal title, but the documentation can take many different forms, as long as the government is willing to protect it. And so one could have uh, a situation where a community has uh, title to the, an entire area of land and people within the, that community by the fact that they're members of the community have rights to that land. Mm -hmm. The question there is, can you show somewhere that you are a member of that community? We want to make sure that people do not fall through the cracks and something happens later and the community leaves, leaves them behind or the government okay. leaves them behind or their family leaves them behind. Yeah, all right. So we're gonna to move to the last 10 minutes of the webinar. So I'm gonna hurry up with the question. So, so one question, because we talk about partnership building, particularly with the private sector. So the question is, how can the private sector, especially the land documentation technology, you know, I think made, owned by the private sector, partner with the non-profit sector and ensure they are having a positive impact. So basically, how can private sector engage with the non-profit sector? Does anyone, more, uh, anyone of you want to take this question? Yeah, Diana, please go ahead. I think I can see you nodding your head. Go I'll ahead. Go, but I think Patricia was jumping to try to answer. Patricia? Uh, no, no, it's, it's up okay, to you, first, Diane. Okay. Diana, first you go and then we go okay. to Patricia, okay. Yeah, I mean, of course, like, like, like with government and with civil society, there are many different ways in which the private sector can engage. So I want to make sure we, we value all the, the different ranges of contributions that can be made. Uh, number one, they can institute good practices when they are uh, uh, starting or expanding their operations in a certain area. They are very well positioned to try to uh, uh, ensure that there's clarity in who has what rights and how those rights are protected. Um, and they are in a position to enforce other actors through the value chain to comply to those same standards as well. Um, in addition to that, in many countries, the private sector, uh, or at least certain actors in the private sector, have a very specific um, um, open door or more open door to um, uh, compel the governments to act and to uh, implement either to, to introduce legal changes or to implement them or to regulate them mm -hmm. um, in a way that allows everybody to have more clarity about those rights and to be more transparent about what's going on. We have to be careful though because um, under current circumstances, and I'm thinking of the, the pandemic, um, governments are going to be strapped for resources and this is therefore a time where um, there are plenty of opportunities for um, stakeholders of all groups to sidestep um, good guidelines. Uh, private sector can also have help with data, can also help with lessons uh, learned and so forth. So, so there are many challenges that, that we can consider. Yeah, okay. Patricia, in the interest of the time, I'm gonna post a different question to you. And the question is about, it says the land rights picture in general for women, women's tenure security is rather grim. Do any of the panelists have a positive story on successful women land rights in terms of SDG targets met? That's what the question. So uh, the question is, we wanna hear a positive story. Is there a positive story that we can share with? 
Patricia? <laughs> I think, yes, yes, there are many positive stories. I think that, uh, you know, learning that uh, I'm not against moni uh, monitoring or informing, creating reports, but we have to be, as uh, I had many conversations, we have to be actionable. And action happens on the ground. We have very many positive stories of ensuring land security. What we want in the private sector has a hole and a huge hole as the donor, as the international con uh, uh, community has an obligation to help, especially in this, er in this phase of post-COVID, because post-COVID is going to be a threat. We, uh, if you look at the, the, we have to take a step back and look at the spirit of the SDG agenda as a whole and say, we have to buy this and not just think about land in isolation, but the intersectionality, we are talking about water, we are talking about everything. So we have very nice, positive stories. It can happen, it can happen if civil society, and well, I'm gonna talk about data and building evidence, the importance of building evidence. In Brazil, we are very lucky, we have national statistic um, data, demo, uh, demographic census, agriculture census, and using these to create uh, analysis from a gender perspective and informing governments. And the private sector is here to like to build the platforms so that all this data can be accessed everywhere. Women on the ground, in very remote areas are using technology. We are meeting, we are doing our capacity building through this uh, high technology. So it is, there is a lot of action. There is a lot of examples. We have to do, tomorrow I have a, a meeting with our friends from the Feminist Land Platform. We have to learn for it, for each other. It's not just working on the very ground, but creating evidence, creating stories, creating, um, let's say, synergy, establishing these uh, huge platforms. So right. that's the good news. Okay. Um, so I think before we wind up this, because we are moving to the last uh, five minutes, there's a very important, this can, 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 this can be a comment, though it's a question. So it says, hello, panelists. Um, this is a good initiative. It would be good to discuss what the custodians have done and what tools are available. Uh, available. Reporting is not just by CSOs, but also by the governments. They have a 